It's a pleasure for me to talk to you today about the MARC 2016 release. And uh, the MARC 2016 release is now on the MSC download site, uh, so it's available for uh, your use. So I'll quickly go through the summary of what this release uh, contains. And what we tried to do is look at all of the uh, four main themes of the MARC product, namely improvements in performance, enhancement to the contact option, um, ease of use, and uh, material behavior for nonlinear materials. So we're going to start off right away with uh, performance. And of course, in contact procedures, we have the node to segment concept and the segment to segment concept, which we've been talking about for the last few years. And one of the things that the segment to segment capability did not support was domain decomposition for parallelization, for distributed parallelization. Of course, it can be used in conjunction with um, element level parallelization as well. This is not a particularly large model. It has about 1.5 million degrees of freedom. And uh, we see that we really have good scalability when we go from the serial mode uh, to four domains. And then since it's not very large, uh, we don't have that much additional parallelization. So nowadays, uh, we really recommend using the segment-to-segment -segment method over the previous node-to-segment method. Another area of performance is really the use of the Pardizo solver. And there's some not so good news, and then there's some good news. So I'll do the not so good news first. In the 2016 release, uh, we're sometimes seeing that the amount of memory that's being used for the Pardizo solver is about 10% higher. This is for a 6 million degree of freedom all solid model. But the good news is if you have more modern Intel hardware, so-called AVX support or AVX2 support, then what you'll see is you'll see a quite nice reduction in the wall time associated with the analysis. In fact, it's close to 25% uh, uh, for this model that's shown here. Of course, if it's a really solid model and it's a well-conditioned problem, then the iterative solver, the CASI iterative solver, is still often substantially faster than the Pardizo solver. So let's now look at contact. And what we've done for contact for the segment-to-segment -segment algorithm is really this is a newer algorithm and we're continuously working to improve the functionality. In the last couple of releases, we added this version equals two, and that gave us better penalty factors and better use of augmentation. And now we've introduced this concept of body order independent. And we said we were body order independent before, but in fact, it wasn't always making the best decisions. And so now we're doing some better decision making when we have one body, let's say, with a high degree of curvature or sharp boundaries contacting another body, which is smoother or flatter. So now that we base the normals on these flatter surfaces. We also have some smarter logic having to do with stiffer bodies versus softer bodies. And when a beam touches either a shell or a beam touching a solid, the beam is always the touching body. And when a shell touches a solid, uh, then, of course, the, the shell is always the touching body. So we have additional smarts in the algorithms. And I'll kind of demonstrate uh, these in these two different models. 
So we have exactly the same physical problem on the left and the right, but we reorder from a user's perspective what the bodies are, and you can see that because they have different colors associated with them. But then when we run the simulation, we get exactly the same results, and we get the same results to four digits of accuracy, and it would be even greater than that if MENCAT displayed those additional uh, digits. And here's another example. Here we have a very flexible rubber ball in a cylinder, so there really are, are two deformable bodies in the symmetry plane. And then if we squeeze the cylinder and look at the time history of the contact forces, we see effectively while the colors have changed because the body order has changed, the results are identical and the trends are absolutely identical. Another thing that we've done for contact is there is this load case. It's often used in manufacturing simulations where we want to move a deformable body from one load case to another load case. It really has to do with process simulation. And we've made that easier to do so that you can move a body based upon a local coordinate system, or you can just say rather than move a certain distance, we can say move from the current position to some particular final position. One of the biggest things that you're going to see when you use MARC 2016 and MENCAP 2016 are some new icons. And they really have two purposes. One of them is to reduce the amount of mouse movement. So we put a series of icons closer to the graphic window, the model window. So if you want to do a full view, rather than going all the way up here, we can just go to this position. We can also see different um, viewpoints by just going to this location. The other thing is we have a whole new set of icons that allows us not to go so deep into the menus. So in particular, these have to do with display, and I, perhaps I'll do a small demonstration. And so rather than having to go into view and then plot control and turn off nodes or elements, one can simply do it from these icons over here. And then some things that we do all the time, like basically want to get a graphical image of the screen. We have an icon that looks like a camera, and it will take the picture. And then one of my favorites is look getting the distance between two points. And again, I no longer have to go to the Tools menu and find distance. It's right here available to use. Another new addition to the MENCAT product is better association with contact bodies and material properties and geometry with parasolid geometry. So if we have this geometry over here, could be any assembly, and if we wanted to associate a contact body with this, we don't need to generate the finite element mesh. We can basically say, I have a contact body, it's a deformed body, and I basically associate it with a parasolid geometry. And that means we don't need to mesh until later on in the process. And of course, we can also do this with uh, geometry, and here what we did was we decided to identify a student strain with all the bodies. And this allows me to point out another capability. We've put the icons associated with all elements or all nodes 
all selected, all unselected, all visible, all unvisible, and some new icons having to do with the top and the bottom or the exterior surfaces right on these submenus. So often you would add the elements and then you would basically need to go back over here to identify which elements or which nodes you wanted to do. Now you simply click right here and it does it for you. So again, less mouse motion. Of course, in the previous release, we already put boundary conditions on the parasolid entities and we continue to do that with the 2016 release. So what does that all allow us to do? It allows us to basically mesh later on in the process. So if I would have changed this geometry, let's say I did a chamfer or blend of this element, then effectively it would have regenerated a new finite element mesh automatically. It would have automatically associated that finite element mesh with the geometry, with the boundary conditions, with the material properties, with the contact bodies, and all other things that are available in the product. Another MENCAT capability is the ability to basically use something known as mesh on mesh, but now to generate predominantly quadrilateral meshes. So before what we did is we had a surface. It could have either been a previously generated triangular mesh or it could be an STL file that came from a CAD system. And we could have basically said, do this mesh on mesh, but it would have generated all triangles. And now we have the capability to generate a quadrilateral dominant type mesh which you might want to use in some other process. This might have been a manufacturing process, and then you might have wanted a quadrilateral mesh to do a structural analysis on this box. Another new capability associated with meshing, something called imprinting. And what imprinting allows us to do is take a geometric entity from one body or ones we make ourselves and imprint it onto another geometry. So here we had two parasolid geometries that we got from CAD. Pretty simple model. It's basically a, a cylindrical body and a, a rectangular body. And we want the finite element meshes to be congruent. So what we do is we take the curve that's associated with the solid body or the edges associated with the solid body and we project that onto the other body. So we effectively imprint it. And now when we generate a finite element mesh on this body and on this body, we will get elements that are aligned with one another and we'll get edges of those elements that are aligned with that circular imprinting. And of course, if we would have generated higher order elements, the mid-side nodes, again, would have got, been projected on the true circle. One of the values of this is when we do mesh generation, we can give additional information like seed points, but we could only have done that on the curves or the edges of these geometric bodies. But we might have wanted to have a point load here, and we might have wanted to have a refined mesh in this region. And what we can now do is we can imprint a point onto the surface and then give a mesh density associated with that point and that will give us a more refined mesh in that area. Another new capability, which really is associated with both MARC and MENCAT, is we can now visualize applied pressures. 
So if we apply a pressure on a, on a body, and here the pressure was defined as a double cosine function through using an equation, before what we could do is we could have gotten out the equivalent nodal loads out of Mark, and then we could have done a little vector diagram or a contour diagram of those equivalent nodal loads, but those loads would have been effectively also a function not only of our applied pressure, but the mesh size. And sometimes you want to really see the true pressure that's applied on the system, and this now gives that behavior. It's very useful if you wanted to do something like fluid-solid interaction and you were obtaining the pressures from some CFD program. Another mesh enhancement, or I should say a user-friendly enhancement, it really has to do with meshing as well, has to do with local adaptive meshing. So in the last few years, we've talked a lot about global adaptive meshing. And we really haven't done much enhancement of global adaptive meshing with the MARC 2016 release, but I can certainly promise that we will for the MARC 2017 release. But you'll see that we've done a variety of things for local adaptive meshing. The first one is if you have a really not such a good mesh and you had some penetration, what the program will now do is when it detects penetration, if you request it, it will locally adapt the mesh. So I hope that uh, everybody has a better meshes than what this was, but you can see effectively what it does, and that works both in two-dimensional problems like this, but also in three-dimensional problems. So this is basically a sheet that we're going to press into this region. It might even be a hydroforming type uh, analysis. And the element size was like that size. It's really the solid shell element. And the solid shell element looks like an eight-node brick. And we can see in these regions of high curvature it senses that penetration might occur, and it refined the mesh in that particular region. So that's a nice way to, you know, start off with a coarser mesh and then have a computationally efficient solution and an accurate solution. There was a feature before having to do with local meshing that whenever two bodies came into contact, in this case, it was a rigid body and a deformable body. It would locally adapt the mesh. But the problem was that over here, you can kind of see a symmetry surface over here. And what it would do is it would locally adapt the mesh on the symmetry surface as well. And that might not have been of, of much interest to you. Of course, in 2D, does it make much difference? Computational costs are low. But in 3D, it makes a difference. So now you can basically say, do local adaptive refinement, but you can say, exclude all the symmetry bodies, or you can be very particular on which body is going to be included in this criteria. And you'll see that in the node and contact criteria, we can say, include the symmetry bodies, or exclude them, or we can say instead of all existing, we can select which bodies should be used for this particular criteria. Really effectively, all the menus associated with local adaptive meshing have been improved. As they've become uh, more readable and there's more information on them, in the, in the past we often took for these criteria parameters without telling you what it really meant. And now what we're really doing is we're saying, okay, if you want to use the criteria, 
and you want the adaptive domain stress error norm to be above F1, and so we tell you exactly what F1 means. And we say exactly how F2 and F3 would be used by these local adaptive criteria. Before, you pretty much have to jump to mark volume A to do that. I'm going to talk a lot about thermally driven problems. And so what we're going to talk about is, again, some new criteria having to do with thermal gradients. So when we talk about problems like welding analysis, when we talk about problems like additive manufacturing, there are very high gradients in the system. And so using thermal gradients as a criteria to have a refined mesh is a good thing to do. And what we've done is we've modified this. So you can use two criteria. You can basically say, I want to based upon the gradient, but also if the temperature is above a certain threshold. And then you can also say that restore the mesh to the coarser mesh when the temperature goes below that threshold. And we'll see that that's a very useful uh, capability. Speaking of also thermally driven problems, we've also enhanced the terminate criteria. For steady state type problems, often we say, well, if the temperature is below 20 degrees C, we're done, even if we haven't reached the total amount of time. Or if the temperature is above a certain value, we're done. We don't need to go any further. That was based upon a global value. It either was set through the auto step criteria or the transient uh, criteria. But it was global. Now we can give you more control. We can do it on a body by body basis. And you can say, I'm done if 80% of my nodes in this body are, in this case, above the value of 500. So there's more user control. The last thing about adaptive meshing is there's a very powerful new capability that allows the program to do multiple levels of adaptive meshing in one increment. So it used to be what we would do is we said, hey, if you fail a certain criteria, refine the mesh. But even after refining, if you would have still failed the criteria, you'd have to wait to the next increment. Now we can do multiple levels in one shot. And again, we're going to see this a little bit later. It basically means that we went from elements that were in this size to elements that were that size to elements in this particular region where you can kind of see the highest temperature and the highest gradient, we're going to refine two levels. Last thing we did having to do with uh, heat transfer and thermally driven problems, again, for problems like welding and other types of problems. Um, normally with welding, before we had what was known as the ellipsoid type heat flux, we've added another type of heat flux, it's the cylindrical type heat flux, Generally speaking, when you do welding that's laser-based, it's a smaller region, but it's a deeper region. And so now you can say that I want to take the amount of power, I give a certain efficiency, and I basically can apply that to this type of geometric nature, and of course, you can, just like we did before, you can use a weld path to basically control the motion of that particular uh, thermal flux normally associated with welding, but also with uh, um, additive manufacturing. And here would be effectively the temperature profiles, 
And what I'm doing here is I'm also showing something that was introduced in the MARC 2015 release, where you can slice through the body at any point and get really nice representations of what the temperatures or what the stresses are internal to the body. So here was that, that welding problem. And you can see we have a very fine mesh here. And you can see that it basically coarsens up when things are, are no longer interesting. This one was done also with a cylindrical heater. But here it's really a thin region. So really it wouldn't have made that much difference. But that cylindrical heater is more applicable when we have a thick region where we have deep laser uh, penetration. One of the things associated with these problems, which moves us to what we'll talk about later, is very often in these problems, the increment size is not driven by the structural problem, but the increment size is driven by the thermal problem or the temperature dependent thermal properties. And so to reduce the cost, what we can do is we can say, well, do a certain number of heat transfer increments and then do one structural increment. And then do a bunch of heat transfer increments and then do one structural increment. And since the structural increments are usually a lot more expensive than the thermal increments, this substantially can reduce the computational costs in these problems. So we talked about um, um, uh, MENTAT, and we talked about a lot of things associated with thermally driven problems. So now I'm going to change a little bit and talk about rubber modeling. And really, the last few releases in 2013, we introduced frequency-dependent damping. Then we had a point release. We expanded it to composites. In 2015, we extended that to amplitude-dependent damping and frequency-dependent damping, the so-called pain effect. And in the March 2016 release, we're introducing some new material data fitting capabilities. And the new technique complements what we did in the past. So you can use your, the same methods for your rate-independent uh, rubber-type behavior or damage-type behavior. But this is in particular for viscoelasticity, some new capabilities for generating the PRONI series or more advanced models when we have data that has incorporated both temperature-dependent behavior through thermal rheologically simple models and certain structural models. So that's one group of new capability that we have. And then we have another set of capabilities to address these um, frequency-dependent damping models, and frequency and amplitude-dependent damping models. So over here, what we're basically doing is we're, we're showing uh, some curve fitting effectively using the Krauss-Ulmer model, which includes the pain effect. And what we're going to basically get out of here is we're going to get out what is the storage modulus is a function of the frequency. And one of the things you might notice right off the bat is that we have a new capability to display this. We can take things that we had in terms of path plots or time history plots, and we can plot them either like we did before in terms of a linear scale or we can plot them in a logarithmic scale, or we can even plot them, in this case, as a log-log scale. 
And of course, when we're dealing with events that are involving either very small times and very large time, this is very useful, or when we're dealing with problems with very high frequency and very low frequency, this is very useful. So a major capability of this is to take the type of data that comes out of the test lab and generate what's known as a master curve. So normally when you do a viscoelastic testing, you use a piece of machine, one of what is called a DMA, a dynamic mechanical analysis. And if you use a dynamic mechanical analysis, what you do is you don't get the behavior from, let's say, very small time to very large time in the time scale, or you could say you don't get the behavior from very high frequency to very low frequency. What you do is you really work in one domain, one range of frequency, and then you work with multiple temperatures. So you would basically say, well, I'm going to have run certain tests cold, low temperature. That means the process is slower. That really represents longer time or lower frequency. Or you could say, I'm going to now do the test at higher temperature. And you can see here we did temperatures between 10 degrees and 90 degrees. And at higher temperatures, that would represent a faster process, which really represents the behavior at shorter times or at higher frequencies. So we obtain the data in this regime, and what we then obtain out of it is effectively a master curve representing here, we're going effectively over uh, eight decrements in frequency, which would normally be difficult to measure. Another thing that we can do is we can enter certain test data, and here we enter different frequencies, and we enter the storage and the loss modulus at different strain levels. And here the table is very regular but it no longer has to be regular. So perhaps at 1% or 0.1% you had all this data, but at 1% you only had a few pieces of data. That's now acceptable. It does not have to be a regular data. So this particular problem is really something having to do with a satellite. Uh, basically we would have the satellite Inside this ring, this ring is basically held by rubber uh, dampers because when you launch the rocket, there's a huge amount of vibration occurring in the rocket. That's why people do things like random response type calculations. But we're interested in what is the frequency dependent and deformation-dependent behavior of those rubber bushings. And so we can use our new curve fitting program for getting out the material data, the material properties associated with this fixotropic and triboelastic model. So it's very, very powerful. And the last thing that we did associated with this is the at MAR 103 class book. So if you're in MENCAT, you go into help and you go to MAR 103, that class book, which has to do with experimental data fitting, material data fitting, that class book has been completely rewritten for the MAR 2016 release. The next thing, well, we did things for rubber. We have to do something for metals as well. Metals are very, very important. I've talked a lot about thermally driven problems. So what we've added is a new phase transformation 
model. So typically in steel, if you're at an elevated temperature, you would be in a state of austenite. And then you might transform to ferrite or perlite or bainite or all the way down to martensite if the temperature rate of change of temperature was slow, the temperature rate goes real fast. We go directly from austenite to martensite. And what we can now do is we can have all the elastic properties to be a function of which phase transformation we have. We have the flow stress based upon the different phases that we're in. And as we evolve the phases, we're going to evaluate the mechanical and the thermal properties based upon the current volume fraction of the phase. Of course, when we have any sort of phase transformation, we also introduce some latent heat. That's, that's true, like if we have an ice cube and it melts into water, we heat it up and it turns into gas. We also have a contribution in addition to the thermal strain contribution having to do with volumetric changes based upon the phase transformation. And the last thing is we have something known as TRIP or transformation-induced plasticity, which again is due to the process that's going on. So the challenge, of course, is there's a lot more material data that you need to enter, and we allow you to enter that in through either time temperature transformation curves or continuous cooling transformation curves. So we're going to take a look at, at what you might see. As I say, here you would have entered the material data, so we're going to start with just ferrite. We'd enter the Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, density, thermal expansion, flow stress, conductivity, specific heat for that phase. Then we would do it for the next phase. And then we have to say, well, if we're at a certain temperature and the process is going along in time, what really happens? Uh, at a certain point in time, at this temperature, we would begin to change from austenite to, in this case, ferrite. And then at some other particular time, we might effectively end that particular transformation. So here we talk about being, um, actually this one was for perlite, uh, at, we would be 1% perlite over here. And then eventually, with long enough time, we would be at 99%. Uh, sorry, the blue one is perlite. i got to get my colors coordinated. Uh, we'd be 99% transferred to perlite. In the March 2016 release, we have not yet provided a material database associated with this capability. It is possible to use in conjunction with the SIMUFACT welding program or the SIMUFACT uh, general program to get the material data as well to be used with MARC. So the first example is a very simple one. Um, it's just basically a block, and we're going to do a very fast process. We're going to be initially high temperature austenite, and then we're going to cool very quickly down to one second. And you can see that the volume fraction goes completely to zero of the austenite stage or phase, and the martensite goes to 100%. And if we do that same process, but slowly, let's say over 10 seconds, then what you see is the austenite drops, but not as dramatically as it did before. The martensite hasn't started, but first what we get is we get a ferrite contribution, and then we get a bainite contribution, and they just basically saturate out. And then with the martensite starts, and then it goes to some value, but we never get 
Martin site when we have this slower process occurring. And this is really important for like heat transfer type simulations, for doing quenching analysis. Um, and so we, we're showing this axisymmetric disk, and we're going to look at a bunch of nodes right here in the corner. Of course, that the node right in the corner is going to cool the fastest. The one on the interior is going to cool the slowest. And what we can do is we can track the behavior. So that node that was closest went from austenite down to 0% very quickly. But other uh, points that are more in the interior never go completely to uh, zero, at least in this particular time. And again, we can see the buildup of the Martin site. Or an important aspect of that is what happens to the surface hardness? What happens if we do a Rockwell hardness test? And at what point do we get a fully hardened type material? And so you can look at the hardness as well. Or you could look at what is the volume fraction at different points in time. So you can see that we still have some austenite uh, here at uh, 20 seconds, or you can really kind of look at all the phases at once and uh, take a look at the transition through these different stages in uh, this particular simulation. So you might notice that in this particular model, given the temperatures and the rate of change of the temperatures, we never had any perlite in the system. We've also introduced some new uh, flow stress equations. Some people love user subroutines. Uh, some people don't. Uh, these are massive generation, uh, generality of power law type uh, flow equations. They're more particular terms. Uh, sometimes they're called the GMT equations, and it's just an alternative to using a user subroutine or giving a, a piecewise uh, linear representation of these uh, behaviors. Uh, finally, um, we've had in the past something known as the Johnson-Cook damage model. Uh, excuse me, the Johnson-Cook uh, flow stress model. We've now introduced Johnson-Cook damage model. This is a model that's, again, well suited for elevated temperature. It really accounts for the increased motion of dislocations at elevated temperatures. So uh, before I uh, go quickly do a demonstration, let me tell you about some exciting things having to do with machine support. The MARC 2016 release is the first release that officially supports Win 10. So we support both Win 7 and Win 10. Uh, we support Red Hat 6.3 for Linux and also SUSE 11 SP2. And in terms of the license file, there are two new features that control this material data fitting and phase transformation. There is an interim license file on the download site. There is no cost associated with um, these new capabilities. If and when we introduce a material database for uh, phase transformations, we'll need to basically charge for that material database because that would come from a third party. Finally, um, in terms of user subroutine, there's been a small change between uh, the previous versions and the current version. The current version, we no longer provide the MKL libraries. Um, Intel no longer allows us to do that. So if you install the new compiler or have installed the compiler, it asks you a question about, do you want cluster support? 
And many people don't know, so they might answer no. But when you run MARC and you want to run with user subroutines, you need to say that you want cluster support so that the Intel compiler also installs these MKL libraries. So if you're a large organization and you have a good IT department, um, hopefully they've, they've done that for you. So let me just uh, do a really fast demo with Mencat so I can show some of the power of these new icons. And so uh, there's uh, Mencat, and I guess I'll, I'll just pretend I'm resetting my orientation. And let's just uh, import a CAD model. Oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Files, uh, import, CAD is solid. I uh, will import a model that I've used in the past. And I guess we should uh, uh, hopefully fill it. Hopefully it's imported. That would be embarrassing if it didn't. Uh, but uh, we might need to uh, display it correctly. So now we've displayed it correctly, and we'll 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 rotate it around a little bit. Let me go the other direction, and um, we we see our our particular model. So again, I I don't need to move so far, and uh, we'll quickly demonstrate some of the things I talked about. So I could go into Material Properties, and I'd go into Material Properties, and I'm just going to import a model, uh, a particular material, and I'm going to give it certain properties. And you can see I can add it directly to the, to the solid geometry. So I don't have any finite element mesh. I'm going to add it to all the solids. And I might want to do contact, and I might say it's a new deformable body. And again, I can just add that body directly to this parametric body. So I can basically say um, I've introduced it, and in this case, I actually had identified a contact on it. But I might want to, you know, say, gee, well, why don't you identify something else? So let's see if I can use the icon. Toggle identification of materials. So if I did that, uh, da, 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 it's, uh, huh. oh, it doesn't think it yet has uh, material to the element. Can't use that one quite yet. Let's add some boundary conditions. And um, I'm not really going to do a contact problem. I'll just add some um, displacements to the bottom of this body. So I'm going to add it to uh, this solid face. And that added the boundary conditions nicely. And I'm going to add some uh, distributed load where you might have had a gasket here, and I'll basically say a, a new uh, face load, and I'll give some pressure. We're not too concerned about the numbers, and I'll put that on a solid face. And uh, here I, ju I just want to put it on that solid face. And so I don't have any finite element mesh yet in my, my, my geometry. So now let's go back and, and actually mesh this. So I might want to do a volume mesh. And I'll say um, just go tet mesh. And um, I'll tell it to mesh that body. And press go. It generated the finite element mesh of that body. And if I wanted to uh, turn on the node numbers or look at the node numbers, I could basically not have to dig deep. I can just click on here and get the nodes 
on and off. Or I could say, gee, I, I don't, I don't want to see the solid anymore. Uh, so I think if I go that, click that button, turn set solids off and regenerate. So now all I'm really seeing is the finite element mesh. I'm not seeing the, 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 the other part of the mesh. So of course, normally we'd want to run this analysis, and we can do that pretty easily. I'm just going to do a, a simple analysis. So I'm going to specify a new load case, just like normal, except I'll only have uh, one increment. My loads are, they were on my solid geometry, but now they're going to automatically be applied to the finite element model. And I can define my job, and I just basically say it's a structural job with my one load case. And I'll just say I want to look at the von Mises stresses. And let's see, what else should I do? I guess I should run the problem. And before I do that, I always like to use parallelization. So I'll say multiple threads. And I'll change it to the CASI iterative solver. I don't think I need any parallelism there. And hopefully I've done everything correctly because it's so easy. And I'll submit the job. And it's running, and it's running, and it's complete. And I open up my post file. And let's say I want to look at the contour bands. And I go to the last increment. And we see that we have nice high stresses. Uh, where I applied the pressure. And just like there are icons for you to select things, so again, we could turn on the nodes and turn off the nodes, but there are icons to basically say things like, we want to see both the deformed and the original geometry, well, here everything was very, very small, so that wasn't very exciting. Or we could say right from the beginning we want to do a vector plot, and what we, we don't have to go multiple levels deep. We immediately see the vector plot with the default being of displacement. So those were the particular displacements. And if we wanted to go back to do a contour plot, again, we would go there. And it might allow me to do contact plots of other things as well, like the total displacement. So we see that basically providing these icons really reduces the amount of mouse travel that you need to do with the simulation and uh, allows a lot more power in terms of model building and model display. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for attending today's session. And uh, hopefully you'll quickly download the latest version of the product. Of course, there are also uh, defect corrections. I should say, I should maybe break out for one second here as well, so one last thing with Mentat. Of course, from the help file, you can always see the latest release guide. And what the release guide will do, among other things, it will basically tell you for any of these new capabilities uh, a little bit about how to use it. But more significantly, the release guide will tell you where are the example problems in the user guide and where are the example problems in the demonstration problem. And of course, one can always go into the help area, go to the user's guide, and basically take a look 
Usually they're in order that we did them, but you can basically go in and look at the examples for this new material data fitting through the examples. And if you want, you can just click the Run button, and that example problem will start playing, and you can watch the whole process of utilizing the new capabilities. So again, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, hopefully uh, we have time for a few questions if there are questions.